So this, this last part of the church year, uh, now and for the next three weeks, we're going to kind of be doing end times, heaven kind of thing. So today is not going to be the be-all, end-all of everything you ever wanted to know about heaven. Uh, neither will the next three weeks, because <laughs> we won't be able to understand it until we get there. But we want to start, we want to listen, we want to... Uh, we want to hear from God what God has told us, because God has our best interest in his heart, and when he, when he reveals things to us, we want to hear with open ears, and see with open eyes, and pray that the Holy Spirit lets us take the message in that God is trying to give to us. Because we've already, we, we've seen uh, in the past few weeks that it's, uh, probably the past like 10 weeks, because the Pharisees have popped up a lot. And the Pharisees were people who were really trying to get it right, and they really got it completely wrong. And so the first thing we want to, we want to approach this with a humility. Uh, we want to approach this idea of heaven with humility, because we can see in the past. And the Pharisees aren't the only ones. You could go through history and find people who have veered off course in the way they look at things. Uh, and so uh, we want to approach this with a humility, and we want, to, we want to listen for what God is telling us. Now, the first thing we have to realize, though, um, is, is uh, the magnitude or, or the, the type of thing that we're talking about when we try to talk about heaven and what eternal life is going to be like and all that stuff. Because we, we need to approach this with the idea that, that there's no way we can really understand it. I think that's the first thing we've got to say. And this is like trying to describe, describe color to a blind person. And trying to describe heaven to people who aren't there yet. And, and trying to describe it physically and what it's like, you know, what's it like to walk around in heaven. Well, that's going to be, you're not, we can tell you things, but, but we're not going to be able to get it. And, and really, it's not even surprising because there's so much of this life that we don't really get. That's amazing. And it's, it's almost hard to, it, it kind of takes us by surprise. And so if there's things in this life that take us by surprise, that challenge our assumptions about the way this world works, how much more is there going to be things about heaven uh, that challenge our assumptions about the way heaven works and the way heaven is and, and who's there and all that kind of stuff? Let me just give you some things that I, I think challenge our assumptions on earth, just in case you, I, I don't think any of you are sitting there thinking you know it all, but it's, it's fun to have our, our preconceived notions shattered once in a while, because it's good for us. <laughs> butterflies, anyone, anyone know how butterflies taste things? With their feet, wow. Matthew, you're gonna have to tell us about that. <laughs> butterflies have receptors on their feet that are remarkably similar to the taste receptors on our tongue. Butterflies taste with their feet. I'm glad I don't taste with my feet. <laughs> when I walk in my kid's room, or I walk it out of the lawn, no thank you. There's a lot of things that, like for instance, for, for most of the history of the world, people didn't realize that just from the standpoint of gravity, things actually fall at the same rate. I don't know if you remember, uh, um, who was the first guy in the movie? Neil John, Armstrong. Neil Armstrong? Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know, there was a, a video he did to demonstrate this, and some of you might have seen it. He held a, a like, something light. I don't know if it was actually a feather or not. But it was something very light, and then a hammer on the moon where there's no atmosphere. And he dropped it, and they both fell at exactly the same rate. Because that's the way gravity works. It actually falls at the same rate. The difference is if something is, is not very dense, it doesn't have the, the mass to push through the air resistance. But it's the air that makes it fall at a different rate, not the weight itself. And so that's kind of counterintuitive, and nobody really realized that until Isaac Newton. So we haven't known that uh, for a long time, really, historically speaking. Here's, a, here's another interesting fact that's a little counterintuitive. You have uh, about three trillion cells in your body. Well, that alone is counterintuitive. But guess what? There's 30 trillion bacteria in your body. There are 10 times as many bacteria in your body as you have cells. Who would have thought? If, if you, uh, um, 
If you, now, if you took all those bacteria and put them into a jug, it would be about a half gallon. You'd have a half gallon of bacteria. And the reason you have 10 times as many is because bacteria are very much smaller than human cells. But that's interesting. It's another thing that, like, you know, you don't think of yourself as a petri dish, I don't think, do you? You think of yourself as a living biological experiment? During flu season, yeah. During flu season, yeah. <laughs> if you don't like the idea of things living on you, let me suggest that you never take a look at your eyebrows. <laughs> Closely. Because your eyebrows are a tiny little ecosystem with mites consuming the, the, anyway, we don't need to go there. It's, uh, anyway, there's a lot of things we, that, that are not part of our normal assumptions that are even about this life. And so as we approach heaven, we want to, um, we want, we want to remember that God is talking about a world that is completely, it's, it's, it's a new heaven and a new earth, but it's also completely different, right? It's, it's a world where there's no more sorrow, sickness, suffering, pain, or death. And the world has had these moments, too. Our history has had these moments. And, and I've mentioned this before, but it's just the most amazing thing to me, that in 1900, uh, uh, leading physicists were telling people who wanted to go into science to go into something else, because really all of the physics stuff had been discovered. <laughs> and it was just a matter of thinking it out. And that's before quantum mechanics and, and Einstein's theory of relativity and all that stuff. And so if scientists can kind of get wrong, I mean, you don't know what you don't know, right? That's the problem. Yeah, I, I remember a time when my brother, we were talking about this, and my brother Eric, I mean, we were like six and eight or something. He, he kind of all of a sudden said, let's think of something that no one's ever thought of before. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> How do you know? It's, and so when we think of heaven, that's kind of the, the way we're thinking. We, we have to remember that, that even the world as we know it is not the world as we know it. Time slows down. The astronauts who come back from space have actually aged a little less by microseconds than the people they left behind on Earth. Yeah. So their spouses are probably jealous. <laughs> so, so things are crazy. Did you, you know, this idea of time actually moving at different rates based on their speed, I read that, um, that those types of equations of math are involved in our global position system. How many of you use navigation systems in your car, whatever? That, that would never work until we realize that time, the, rate, the flow of time is actually very good. Because the satellites move fast enough that the, the, the locations would get inaccurate over time. That's, that's crazy stuff. I mean, you and I don't walk around the world thinking, oh, well, time is variable. Although, I have noticed that I can, I can uh, take what seems like a two minute shower in the shower, and I get out, and 10 minutes has gone by. <laughs> that's right, relativity is everywhere. Uh, let's see, what else I got? Oh, that, that, that's not. I got another one. So, so, the point of all this is that we're continually finding different ways to understand our own world. We're continually finding out things that surprise us. We're finding out that we didn't know what we thought we knew. It's all different than we thought. And so as we approach this idea of, of heaven, we, we don't want to approach it with the, the concreteness of those physicists in the 1900s who thought everything had already been discovered. Because the, they, were they were living in the world where physics is happening and they didn't even know about relativity and quantum mechanics and all that stuff. How much less do we who live in this world who will be headed to heaven, who God is just trying to tell us about how much less can we assume that we really get it. And so as we read all these things, what we want to do is we want to just kind of let them wash over us and say, what? Let, let, let me just hear what God has to say. Let, let, me just, let it just kind of settle on me. And in fact, when we get into heaven, what we really find is that we end up having to rely on symbolism and poetry. Because symbolism and poetry communicates things that that, that uh, sort of linear descriptive language cannot. How many people have ever been proposed to or proposed using sort of simple descriptive language about love? I would like to spend time with you because when I am with you, I, I'd like to marry you because when I'm around you, I, I get sweaty on my palms and my heart beats faster. 
You're all feeling all romantic now? <laughs> <laughs> no, because love is so deep. Love is deeper than plain language can do. And that's where we use poetry and symbolism, is to get at things that are deeper than simple descriptive language can bring us to. And so when we talk about heaven and, and, and eternity and things like that, we end up relying on symbolism and poetry and, and art. But then when you, when you rely on those things, you recognize that they're all, those are inherently cloudy. They inherently leave you room to grapple and think and, and just sort of move around in them. And they're not, nobody, I mean, I guess people argue about poetry, but I don't see that poetry is something to be argued about. It's something to be experienced. Uh, paintings are things to be experienced. Art is experienced. People who argue about art, I think, in a lot of, I mean, I guess you can, but people who argue about art are like people who want to get to know a frog by dissecting it. I mean, you can take apart a frog and learn and find out all the veins and organs and everything, but now all you've got is a tray full of parts. <laughs> and you don't actually know what a frog is. And, 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 and I think that, that art is like that, and I think that heaven is like that. So we end up using poetry and symbols. <laughs> and, 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 and people, this is where, and, and this is where I think people get the idea of exploring heaven quite wrong. Quite wrong. I read one guy who was reading through Revelation, and the passage we're going to read and sort of let wash over us at the end of the message this morning, describes the new Jerusalem that comes down out of the sky, and it's about, it's a big cube that's 1,500 miles in each direction. And so for us, we ask, so what is that? I mean, is that, is that trying to say something? That there's something about perfection in there? And there's something about size? And, 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 and some people say, well, let's say everybody gets 200 square feet. How many people could fit in heaven? And then we'll know. And I read somebody else who said, who, who discerned from this scripture that clearly there is either no or greatly reduced gravity in heaven which should be interesting. And he said it's because a cube that size would clearly collapse into a sphere under the weight of gravity as it is in our universe. Now, really, what if molecular bonds are strong? I mean, you, I don't even want to go down that road. But what if molecular bonds are twice as strong? So we can, I, you know, who knows? If you want to go down that road, you can go down a million different roads. But, but so, you're mis I, I think we're missing the point if we start doing calculations like this guy. And so now, now we're just gonna, one of the things uh, that we wanna look at is, um, and, and I think, because this is all same saying, we're thinking about and remembering with, with love and gratitude those who've gone before us. One of the things people wonder is where are they? <laughs> where are they now? And this is just gonna shock you. So, Christians argue about this. <laughs> Christians argue about everything. I'm being sarcastic. I shouldn't be sarcastic. Um, but, and so what I want to do is, basically there's two, there's two kind of pictures that are painted in the Bible. And we kind of got to look at them and say, what's going on? And, and, I, and I don't think we want to get to the technical arguing because they're kind of both there to be held in tension. One is that uh, one is that people who die are sleeping, and they, and then at the end of time they are raised. And the other is that people go to be directly with Christ the moment they die. And so we're just going to read through a few passages here. I'm going to move out of the way so I can see them because I'm going to put a few of them on the screen. We're going to read through a few passages, and, and what we're going to we're going to try to fold them together a little bit. But the, the idea of, of uh, death itself being destroyed by God is not a New Testament idea. It's an Old Testament idea. So we'll start with that. In Isaiah, uh, a prophet several hundred years before Christ, uh, he, he wrote, uh, uh, speaking of God, he will swallow up death forever. And then that verse continues. And the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth. The Lord has spoken. And we will say, Behold, this is our God. We waited for him that he might save us. We waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And so even in the Old Testament, that's, this, that's very similar language to Revelation, isn't it? Swallowing up death. 
And again, and that's a poetic metaphor, right? I mean, that's, that's, we're not looking for God to be Pac-Man, right? Oh, swallow up, yeah. That's like, you know, it's gone. It's only, when you swallow something, you have completely overtaken it. And so God is going to overtake death. And that, that, that notion, that idea, that revelation has been with us from the Old Testament. So now we get into this idea of what happens when we die. And, and what we're, I'm going to give you some Bible passages that are going to kind of take us back and forth. Uh, the first one is this. The hour is coming, Jesus said, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. So what does that mean? And, and, and it has to... To start with, the, the people of Jesus' day were, were not only as familiar with death as you and I, but more familiar with death than you and I. They were not as familiar with the decay of bodies, but more familiar with the decay of bodies than you and I. You remember what uh, Jesus told it when, when Jesus went to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead? Uh, he said, roll the stone away. And you, do you remember, anybody remember what Mary said? It's going to stink. Right? Because we know what happens to bodies. They decompose. They decay. And it's going to smell. And she knew it. And, and so when, when he says, those who are in the tombs, we have to already say there's something poetic going on here. Because the people then, like us now, know that after a few years, there's no body in the tomb. There's nothing there. It's a, unless you've been mummified, right, or you're in a dry crypt or something like that. But for most people who are buried in the ground, even, by the way, I've been told by an undertaker that even if you get one of those concrete, you know, vaults around your casket, it, it doesn't actually, I mean, it keeps the water out for a while, but co concrete is porous, and sooner or later the water gets in, and all you're doing is, you know, paying to postpone the decomposition for a little while. So, anyway. You can buy what you want. I think there are ways to buy. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, you have to get one? Oh, well. Okay. Well, <laughs> well here we go. <laughs> so, so already, we, we're, we have to say, we have to say that there's something poetic, poetic going on. There's something metaphorical. There is a picture that is being painted in our minds that is not intended to be a, an utterly literal, scientific style picture, okay? That's where we gotta go with this already. Now we flip to the other side and we hear now, Jesus is on the cross and, a, and the thief says, remember me Jesus when you come into your kingdom and Jesus says, today, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So there's an immediacy there, right? There's, that's like right now. And, and in fact, um, it was even, uh, some people like to point out there's a little bit of a propheticness to that because usually it took about three days to die on a cross. And when Jesus said today, the thief would probably say, well, maybe even a day or two. And uh, in, in this instance, they broke the leg to the thieves so that they would die quickly that day when they were crucified instead of hanging there for a couple days. So, uh, but anyway, I don't think that's what Jesus was doing. I think once again, we have to say, we have to stand back a little bit and let the picture be painted. Today, you will be with me. And then some people say, like, well, but Jesus, like, died and went to hell. And then he rose on the third day. Where was he in between? Was, and they start trying to draw diagrams and flow charts. And I don't think that's what's going on. I don't think that's the way we're meant to understand it. What, Jesus, what the thief needed to hear was, I'm, I'm going to paradise to be with Jesus. And there's no delay, there's no blackness, there's nothing to endure on the way. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. So, we kind of have one of each. Now we're going to go back to the other. Uh, when the Son of Man comes... Oh, didn't mean to go there again. So, as we read through this, there's a lot of verses that kind of go back and forth on, on, on later or now. Like uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says that Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. As in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and then at the coming, second coming, those who belong to Christ. So that sounds like later. 
Then we get Philippians 1, verse 23 to 24. Paul's like talking to himself almost. He says, I'm hard pressed. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better, but to remain here in the world is better for you, my beloved brothers in Christ. It's more necessary on your account. Now, Paul is not, by the way, arguing about suicide when he says, I'd like, I, you know, part of me wants to just go. Paul is on trial, right? I mean, you could choose to defend yourself or not, too, right? So uh, there's that. So that's analogous, because Paul says, I could depart and be with Christ. He doesn't say I can depart and enter into soul sleep. I could depart and go into a state of non-consciousness for 10,000 years or whatever. He says I could depart and be with Christ right now. But then we have Paul writing in 1 Thessalonians. And this is one that is used often at funeral services. We do not want you to be informed, brothers, about those who are asleep. He calls them asleep. The ones who died. That you may grieve, not grieve as those who have no hope. For since we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And there he calls them asleep again. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and the voice of the archangel, and the shout of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ will rise. And so we're left with this immediate but asleep. And we just kind of have to say, hmm. And what some people say, and I, I, my opinion is that they are just sort of going further than they need to go. I think they're not just kind of holding this up in tension. They, the, and, and this is the standard Lutheran teaching in case you want the party line. The party line is this, that uh, when we die, our, our soul departs our body, and our soul goes to be with Christ immediately. And then at the end of time, the, the souls who have been with Christ will be reunited to their new glorified bodies. And so there is a, a, a resurrection, a re-lifing, a re-embodying of the souls, but yet the soul is still a distinct, you know who you are and everything, you're just with Christ, uh, you know, without a body. And I'm not really sure how that explains anything. What does that mean to be a person without a body? See, it, 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 I think that particular explanation just pushes it back one step. The, the, the difficulties, the things we have to think about. But, that, but that's, the, that's the party line. I, I think my opinion is it's just unexplainable to us. To me, I like the, the best thing I like to think of it as a, is a... Um, is sort of a, a temporal jump. I, I think we all just sort of we jump out of our time and into God's time. And so all these references to when it happens, they don't really make sense from the other side. Because in God's time, you can see all of our time laid out like a map. But one thing the Bible does talk about, when, wherever this happens, what is clear is that the dead are with Christ. And they are at peace because of him. And that, some, and, and that either right away through my little temporal warp theory or at the end of time, uh, like the Lutheran party line teaches, uh, our body will be transformed. Paul writes to the Philippians in uh, chapter 3, verse 20 to 21, Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And so, whether or not it happens right away through my warp theory, or at the end of time, our, our lives, our new lives, will be lives in bodies, but they'll be perfect bodies. They'll be bodies that no longer need knee replacements, or, or whatever else has gone on <coughs> in your body, that, that won't happen anymore. There'll be no more breakdown. The breakdown will be done, because the old order of things will have to pass away. And as, as we think about heaven, one of, one of the things that happens, uh, at least it happens to me, uh, is I think about my loved ones who have passed away, uh, and I, I, wonder, I wonder where they are. I wonder where they are. And, uh, and when I do that, sometimes I end up 
end up with a lot of fear and some anger. Because I'm like, you know, I, I, get, I, I, I get that way when I think of uh, people in Africa who haven't heard the name of Jesus, you know, people who live in remote areas and stuff like that. People raised in China where there's no possibility of hearing about a Savior. And, and, and I start to get, I kind of get angry about heaven. It's like, why am I there and they're not? But that's not fair. I don't belong there. I, I'm a sinner. I don't belong in heaven. I'm a sinner. I don't belong in heaven. They're sinners and they don't belong in heaven. What do I do with that? How could that be fair? How could that be right? How could that be good if God is good? And I'll tell you where I go with that. That, again, is tension that, that we are left with. What we know is that those who call on the name of Christ will be saved. There is a certainty available for anyone who will listen and receive. We also know that not everybody is going to go to heaven in eternity, which is a horrible thing. But well, the thing, the, the place I go when I start thinking those thoughts is I go back to Jesus. And let me tell you why. Because the, 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 the Bible is filled with stuff that can be misinterpreted. And the Pharisees, again, are the perfect example of that. They are, they are honest, uh, generally speaking, except when confronted with Jesus. They were honest, hardworking, trying to do the right thing, trying to follow the law, and they went horribly wrong because they had read the law and then, and then interpreted it through their culture and, and their assumptions and everything else. And what the Bible says, it, it, the Bible paints us a picture of how horribly wrong we can go in our thinking if we rely just on our logic and just on our cultural assumptions and all these things. And what it says is that if you really want to know God, look at Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus is the one who's going to be separating one from the other. Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory with all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. And before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates a sheep from the goats. And that is a scary, scary thing. But I'll tell you what, it would be scarier if it wasn't Jesus. It would be scarier if it was me. I'll tell you, I want that seat. But when I worry about it, when I think the hard thoughts about eternal life, I start thinking about Jesus. And I think about the woman caught in adultery. And I think about the tax collectors. And I think about the prostitutes. And I think, you know what? I think, I don't know who's going where. It's not my job to judge, but I trust the judge. I trust the judge. And so when we think about heaven and hell, and who goes where, and what happened to our loved ones, my encouragement to you is to look at the face of Jesus. Trust the judge. Because Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is more trustworthy than you. He's more trustworthy than me. He is, he is the face of the infinite and compassionate and loving God. Who, who will not quench a smoldering bleed, uh, a wick, who won't break a bruised bleed. When you start thinking those thoughts, turn your eyes back to Jesus. Because that's who everyone else in heaven is looking at. They're not looking at their lives. They're all looking at Jesus. And so when you think those thoughts, you just look at Jesus and you say, you know what? I don't get everything about everything and that there's some Bible pastors that make me awfully nervous. But that man, I trust him. And the Bible says that he is the one to judge the world. So let me close with this picture of, of heaven. It's uh, Revelation 21, 9 to 26. And, let, and just kind of Think of this, it's, it's a vision, which is a little different than a dream, but, but he's, it's, it's a description of an undescribable place. And, and, he's, and, and John is trying to paint the picture for us so that we can get a sense of heaven. Even if we can't get a literal description. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues, and he spoke 
to me, saying, Come, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for God, having the glory of God and its radiance like a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the 12 gates were 12 angels, and on the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. On the east there were three gates, and on the north there were three gates, and on the south there were three gates, and on the west there were three gates. This is an open city. It's an open city for people to come in. Gates all over the place. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and there were 12 names, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to go measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city lay four square. It was a cube, and its length was the same as its width. And I measured this, the city with the rod, and it was 12,000 stadia. That's 1,500 miles. And its length and its width and its height are all equal. And he also measured the wall. And it was 144 cubits by human measure, which was also the angel's measurement. And the wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold, but like clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. There was jasper and sapphire and agate and emerald. There was onyx and carnelian and chrysolite and beryl and topaz and uh, chrysoprase and jacinth and amethyst. And the 12 gates, they were 12 pearls. Each of the gates made out of a single pearl. And the street in the city was pure gold, also like transparent glass. And there was no temple, for the temple is the Lord God Almighty. And the, the city had no need for sun or moon to shine on it, because the glory of the Lord gives light. And its lamp is the lamp. And by its light the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory. And the gates will never be shut by day, and there's not going to be any night. And they will bring in it, bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. It's a if you try to dissect the picture of heaven, you're not going to end up with the picture of heaven. It's going to be like the frog. You're going to end up with a pan spoon of parts that don't tell you anything about the frog itself. When you see a picture of heaven, you just have to stand back and say, a golden city covered with jewels, with gates everywhere that are always open. Let's pray. Father in heaven, You have uh, communicated your love to us, your deepest love in Jesus and the sacrifice he made uh, by going to the cross for the forgiveness of our sin. And, uh, and you have, uh, in your love, you've, you've attempted to at least communicate in emotional, poetic kind of language words that would give us a sense of the glory and majesty and beauty and wonder of your eternal city. And uh, Father, we know we're not really going to get it until we get there. But we thank you for trying. And we ask you to open our eyes to see what you're really trying to communicate to us. You've communicated your love and forgiveness and redemption in Jesus. And you've shown us a picture of how amazing and wonderful our eternal life with you will be. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. We'll have the ushers come forward and collect the prayer cards. And, uh, the